über allen Gipfeln ist Ruhe. In allen Wipfeln spürest du kaum einen Hauch. Die Vögelein schweigen im Walde. Warte nur, bald ruhest du auch. Over all the hills now, repose. In all the trees now, shows. Barely a breath, birds are through, that sang in their wood to the west. Only wait, traveler, rest, soon for you too. Joining me on stage is Cesar Conde, who is our partner for the Aspen Ideas Festival, a great defender of the First Amendment and leader in media, chairman of NBC Universal News Group. Cesar, thank you. And the words you just heard were the poem, Song of Traveler at Evening, or Wanderer's Night Song, by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. The music is Albert Schweitzer playing Bach on his beloved instrument, the, the organ. As you can see, we are reaching back and touching our story of Argens here. And it's a fitting tone setter for why we are gathered here today at the midpoint of the 2022 Aspen Ideas Festival. As some of you know, the very first event of the Aspen Institute was held on these very grounds in 1949 with a three-week celebration of the birth of Goethe. If Kitty Boone had been in charge, there would have been a wider array of topics besides Goethe. But that's what they focused on for three weeks because they cared about stitching together the humanism again in the aftermath of war and genocide and forced migration and nuclear devastation and the rise of the Soviet system. And the question was, what is it that brings humanity together? How can we create a good society? And one of their answers is this beautiful place called Aspen, Colorado, and all of the culture and ideas and community that's been fostered here. But it was a time of tumult and division, but also hope. That's not unlike the world we live in today. Tumult, division, but surely hope and optimism and determination. Reflecting on this history and our founding moments reminds us of the importance of the work of the Aspen Institute. That what we do today to do the, our best to drive change inclusively with so many, change towards what? A free, just, and equitable society. And all of you are partners with us and we with you in that great and noble vision. Thank you again for being here. And it's so exciting to be able to mark the transition of Aspen Ideas Festival with our new media partner, NBC Universal News Group. It's really a bold chapter in the Institute's history as working with Caesar and his team, we are able to amplify still more voices and get those voices heard still more widely in more communities around the country and around the world with the hope of pulling people together towards a better tomorrow. And we have loved the spirit of collaboration and camaraderie we've experienced with the NBC team in planning this year's festival. We've also worked with NBC on other big events like the Aspen Security Forum and our big event in Miami Beach earlier this year on the climate crisis. We've learned together that we do so much more together in collaboration than we could ever do alone. And NBC Universal and Caesar have been fabulous and fun partners. We thank you so much. Let me turn it over to Caesar now. Thank you, Caesar. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, Dan. It is such a, an honor for, for me and for all of us at the NBC Universal News Group to work with you and kick off our partnership um, with the broader Aspen Institute team, uh, not only during the summer with all, all these uh, other conferences, but particularly this week with the Ideas Festival. Um, we are, as we all know, living in such consequential times, both here at home as well as abroad, and so I, I, we hope that the incredible work that the teams have done to put together these programs, um, hopefully it feels as timely and as relevant uh, as was the intent. 
Um, for us, you know, Dan, as you know, it is a tremendous honor for us to be working um, with you and the team in honoring that uh, long-standing Aspen tradition uh, of bringing together leading experts from around the world to come here to Ideas Festival and talk uh, about, br bring us insights about the challenges that we are seeing in, uh, in our world today and hopefully uh, help us all begin to build some ideas and solutions around them. And, you know, the other thing that I wanted to, uh, to mention very quickly is for us at, uh, at the NBC Universal uh, News Group, this partnership has been, as Dan alluded to, uh, based on collaboration. And, and hopefully uh, you will see that collectively these, these two teams have done incredible work um, and the program really is, is, a, is a product of that collaboration. One of the things, for example, that you'll see later on uh, in the presentation this afternoon is our uh, chief foreign correspondent, Richard Engel's interview of President Zelensky. Um, this would not hap have happened without uh, both organizations really bringing their best uh, and, their, um, and all of their energy to bringing that uh, together to make it happen. You know, the other thing that I, I wanted to reinforce that we're particularly very excited um, is that for us at the NBC Universal uh, News Group, we are gonna be bringing the very best of the Ideas Festival to audiences beyond the incredible, incredible campus of the Aspen Institute. We think it's important that we bring some of this great content to broader audiences, again, not just here in the United States, but, uh, but around the world. Um, so with that, um, thank you. So with that, uh, just uh, an another message of gratitude from, from all of us. Thank you all for being here. We really hope that you're going to, uh, to enjoy the program today and the rest of the week. Thanks again. So let me uh, introduce now uh, Secretary Arnie Duncan, uh, who's gonna be walking out with, uh, with the panelists that he will introduce, and they will be talking about breaking the cycle of gun violence here in America. Secretary Duncan. Good afternoon. Thanks so much for having us. This is a, a different audience than what we're used to, so really, really appreciate the chance to be here. Um, as I said, my name is Arnie Duncan. Uh, this would be sort of a, a tough topic, but hopefully uplifting and inspiring as well. Just a quick sort of intro in terms of what we do and why. Uh, gun violence, unfortunately, has haunted me my whole life. I started to lose friends, guys who helped protect me on the south and west sides when I was playing basketball when I was a teenager. I think that stuff sort of shapes you and scars you in some ways, a little bit difficult to talk about. Fast forward from my teenage years to 20, 20 years after that, I led the Chicago Public Schools for seven and a half years. Lots I'm proud of, happy to talk about that on another session. But on, on my watch during my time in the Chicago Public Schools, on average we had a child killed every two weeks due to gun violence. It was a staggering rate of loss. Thank God never in a school, but walking home, at home, going to a corner store, on a bus. And I don't think I know we as adults failed to keep our kids safe. Um, when our family moved to D.C. in 2009, I thought things were as bad as they could be. They couldn't get worse. And unfortunately, things got a, a lot worse for a whole lot of reasons. So for me, coming home to Chicago in 2016, this felt like the crisis facing the city. I thought it was being unaddressed. People were either a little paralyzed or overwhelmed and wanted to try and figure out what to do. I'll give you a couple facts and a couple quick opinions, and we'll get into a conversation. So just facts. Chicago is six times more violent than New York. Chicago is three to four times more violent than L.A. We are the anomaly, it doesn't have to be that way, it shouldn't be that way. People often say, well, Chicago has strict gun laws, so the gun laws don't work. But I always say Chicago is not an island, we don't have a moat around us. Indiana is 15 minutes from my house, the guns pour into us from Indiana, Wisconsin, Mississippi, and other places. So that doesn't work. Folks often say if you're having violence, having high crime, you need more police. We actually have as many or more police than New York and LA per citizen. So if more police made us safer, Chicago would be the safest city in the, in the country. Um, in fact, one of the biggest drivers of violence, unfortunately, is police ineffectiveness. Very few crimes get solved in the communities that we're gonna talk about, Roseland on the south side, North Lawn on the west side. If you shoot and kill somebody, there's a 10 to 11% chance that you get arrested. So that means there's an 89 to 90% chance that there is no consequences. And so one of the biggest drivers of violence is retaliation. When folks don't have justice in the criminal justice system, 
they take it upon themselves to have, have street justice. So as a private citizen coming home, um, I would love to get rid of the guns. I'm pretty radical. I didn't know how to do that. I would love to rebuild trust between the police and the community, but that's going to take decades. That's going to take the police admitting something's actually wrong, which that hasn't happened yet. So I didn't know how to do those things, but I did think that we could create hope and opportunity for young people and give them a reason to put down the guns. So that was the genesis of Chicago Cred. We've evolved and changed a lot over the past five and a half years. We've worked with our partners with about 1,000 primarily young men, but we also have women, we have teens, we have some older guys, we have 18 to 24s. Seven is uh, 75 to 80% of who's shooting and being shot in Chicago on the south and west sides. And the profiles of the victims and the perpetrators are the same. It's literally often the same person. And so there are five pillars to our work. We have an amazing street outreach, te outreach team. These are guys from the different cliques, from the different gangs. They're like our HR function. They recruit folks into our program. We did give everyone a life coach, and Hicks is one of our star life coaches. We'll talk about that. We always say experience can be the best teacher, but it doesn't have to be your own experience. You can learn from others. We have an amazing clinical team. We have to help our guys heal from a lifetime of trauma. It's a saying that hurt people hurt people, and that's true, but also healed people can heal themselves and their families and the community. We have an education tutors. We've had lots of folks get high school diplomas. We have a set of folks in college. Billy's gonna graduate from college in, in, uh, not, not, too, not too long from now. That's been amazing to see. And then we have a jobs team. And our goal is to move folks from the illegal economy, which in Chicago all too often leads to violence, to the legal economy. So our young men and women work with us usually for a year to 18 months. We then have about 44 employers in 17 different industries who hire at the back end. And uh, we've been at this five and a half years. We've had some folks working for four, four and a half years now. So that's been, been pretty amazing making that transition. But that's, that's, the, that's the background. And we just really want to get into a, a conversation. Everyone's story is so powerful. I said Hicks is a star life coach of one of our best partners, the Youth Peace Center in Rosen on the south side where he grew up, where he lived. And he was used to battle with guns, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute, but I really think he battles for the hearts and minds of our young people now. And it's almost like playing chess. He's trying to show them what's the right next move or what's the wrong move and what, how do you move strategically. But it's, no, it's not a game. It's, 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 it's literally life and death. And that if our young men make the wrong move, and we've had too many losses, it literally costs them their life. Our young people are growing up in war zones, and we'll talk about that. But Mr. Hicks, if you can you know, give the audience a sense of what are the most important lessons, there's so much you're trying to teach and instill every single day, what are the most important lessons that you're trying to instill in our young men? Um, I think the most important lesson I'm trying to instill in our young men is to let them know that you know, you're hurting someone's family. Um, you're hurting the mother. Um, I just was looking at a bag I keep with like 19 obituaries in it from this year alone. Um, it's, hurt, it's, it's hard for to see a parent crying. Um, we assist at funerals. Some of these people I don't even know. We just go just for the support and security. And just trying to let guys know, you know, it's something better than life than going to shoot someone and killing them. Um, and, and like Arnie said, the chances of you getting any repercussions from it is slam to nine. So that in itself creates a monster. Um, if I know I can go shoot and kill someone, nothing's gonna happen to me. Um, then I'll continue to do that until and, and I meet my fate. And, and that's what we try to keep our guys from doing, um, going down the wrong path and making those same mistakes. And you've talked a lot about the addictive power of guns and the, the power that guns had over you. And for folks that maybe don't understand that culture, don't understand that life, give them a little sense for that. It's, it's nothing like it. You know, um, to our culture and our generation, um, you can offer a young man $30,000 or or 30 guns, and he's going to take the 30 guns. Um, it's, a power, it's, it's a sense of invincibility. Um, it's, it's rehabilitation that comes with it. You just have to be able to work with these guys and don't give up. Um, I know a lot of people look at Chicago news and they think the worst. The news is just a small portion of what the media want to put out there. But what the actuality is is the groundwork we put in with other organizations assisting us to help redirect some of the behaviors. Um, and it works. We do have hard times. I'm not going to sit here and say everything is peace and cream. We have tragedy. We have triumph, ups and downs. But um, I work with a team of people who haven't given up yet and don't, don't look like they're going to give up no time soon. And, and that's what motivates me every day. And plus, it's therapeutic for me. It keeps me level-headed because I was a gun head. I, I, don't, I don't think it was a gun I didn't own. But, but now I'm seeing how, how things have changed, man. It's, you know, the capacity of the rounds. Um, you know, they run around shooting at what they call a switch. That's the most known thing out in Chicago. It's probably like 50 rounds within a second. 
Um, you can't even get, get away from that. You can't run or anything. So it's just, it's, it's just a hell of a battle. And it's a battle for us as life coaches to stay alive too because we're dealing with both sides. He's from one organization. I got to deal with somebody from another organization and they don't get along. So sometimes they look at me like, you know, whose side you on? So, you know, you just have to keep it clean, man. Keep your head on the swivel. One thing we really believe is that to do this. Yeah, thank you. This is absolutely visceral, visceral, boots on the ground, hands on. This is not Ivy Tower researchers or policymakers. These are folks with lived experience. And unfortunately, Hicks spent more than a decade incarcerated at different times. And we go into Cook County Jail and recruit young men out of Cook County Jail to come into our program and they get out. And you went back with me one time as a free man to go into Cook County Jail. What was that experience like? Well, so if you don't know Cook County Jail, um, when, you, when you arrive at Cook County Jail as, as, a, as a prisoner or inmate, you, you get stripped to nothing. Um, you get on this yellow line, you spread them, you do everything, cough, all the stuff you see in movies. But fortunately, this time, um, I remember Arnie saying, do you want to go up there? And I was kind of hesitant, like, yeah, but I don't want to go through all the procedures. So none of that happened to cut a long story short. I was able to go in there untouched, unscathed, go on the same deck where I used to be housed at and, and, and talk to some of the same young men. And then the best part about that, um, a few of those guys were released and we now serve them. So it's just, it's just a good thing. You just got to, you got to trust the process, man. I know it's, if you, people sit here and listen to us, and it may seem tragic, man. Trust the process. It's, it's, it's more tragedy uh, in your mindset than it actually is out in the city of Chicago. So, you know, and, and it's a great feeling to do this work. Um, I don't know no other work I, I, I'd rather do that's meaningful to me. I'm in my own community where, I, where I've had my hiccups, my trials and tribulations. And I'm actually, I'm literally, literally working on the same block where I had all my problems at. Every day. Every day. Amen. We have a long, long way to go. Chicago is still way too violent, but Rosen on the south side, and we'll get to the west side in a minute. Rosen, where Hicks grew up, where he lives, city's down about 10% this year in terms of violence. Rosen's down 30%. And we, we hate the holidays. I used to love the holiday. We hate Memorial Day. We hate Fourth of July. We hate Labor Day. Memorial Day, we had zero shootings in Rosen in North Lawndale. But... Yep, yep. But the, the, the fact that we're, you're down in rows and we're down three times what the city's down, what does that feel like to you? What does that mean to you? I mean, it's kudos to the work. Uh, it's other organizations besides Chicago Prayer. It's other partners we work with. Um, it's, it's kudos to the first responders and, and building those relationships. We do work with a, a, um, a lot of gentlemen that were former street members. Um, and so the connection is, is very deep, it's meaningful. And, and it's a thought, thought out process. Nothing is just done spontaneously. Um, we have staff meetings. Um, we have clinical meetings where we sit with therapists and sit down and, and go over assessments. So it, it, it's a process. It's not just you meet this young man and you start serving him. Um, you get assessments to see if he's safe to come to this site. Um, do we have to service him out of town? Do we have to relocate him? Do we have to send him to this, this man over here in the orange building? So it's a process, strategic process, but it works. It works, and if you want to, if you want to see it work, um, jump on a flight and visit Chicago. Come to Rosen, give Anya a call, and we'll take you on a tour. We have guests all the time. People get sick of hearing from me, so we'd love to have some more guests. So You're welcome. I mean that very sincerely. Let me shift to, to Aaron, and Aaron, obviously for us coming out here to Aspen, this is a different world, and you got out and mountain biked a little bit this morning. But for folks that might not know Chicago, who might not know the South Side, who might not know Roseland. One, talk about what it's like to grow up in Roseland. I think many folks may have a perception, and our world is incredibly gray, it's incredibly complex, there's no black and white, but they may have a perception of what it is to be a, a gang member. And that's a scary thing, that's a dangerous thing, and I talk about, I, I grew up probably four miles from where you grew up, but it's a different neighborhood, and both my parents were educators, so my sister and brother and I all became educators, that was our family business, but based upon your family, your block, where you grew up, it was a different path, and give people some sense of that. Um, so, me growing up, fell into the gang life early. I wanted to be a part of it um, for the sake of the fact I thought it was cool. You know, the guns, the drugs, the women, everything else. You know, I thought it was all cool. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, 
growing up in the gang life, I done went through more hell than blessings, safe to say. Um, a lot of deaths, close friends, um, overdoses on drugs. Um, coming up from Roseland, a lot of black owned businesses, you know, uh, well, it's a lot of businesses, you know, that's not even there anymore, you know, as far as like, you know, um, money loss and murders, you know, people, what, call, what they call it, poverty, things like that. So, I mean, growing up in Roseland, it, it, was, it was hard for anybody who was in the game, but, at the same, but we had no sense of direction during that time, so. And people often have a perception that, you know, everyone carrying a gun is a, a threat, a predator, or whatever, and unfortunately, because our neighborhoods are so unsafe, because people do not feel protected by the police, many folks feel compelled to carry a gun. So talk about at what age you started carrying a gun and why. I started carrying a gun at the age of 14. Um, I watched my brother carry guns. You know, I wanted to be just like him. I put myself in the gang life at an early age and I made enemies at an early age, literally before I was in high school. So carrying a gun, it was a sense of my protection just because I put myself in the mix and I don't let them guys know my face and where I'm from and where I be. So carrying the gun for me was just basically to fend off what I was asking for. So we talk about people who were playing offense versus playing defense. Did you see yourself as someone who's playing offense or playing defense? I always played defense. <laughs> I never played offense to elaborate a little bit. Playing offense is basically you going looking for the trouble. So if I'm playing offense, I'm looking to go kill somebody. I play defense. I'm in my area, sitting there chilling, minding my business until somebody come through there and act crazy. And then that's when I play defense. Other than that, no, I don't, I don't do offense. And t talk about what you're doing now what's changed, but also having folks, and it's not just, as Hicks said, we have incredible teams of folks who do this work. We just have a couple of us here. We have a lot more folks back home doing the work right now as we're, we're speaking, but talk about what it's like having folks like, like Hicks and Billy in your life and what you're trying to do now. So I came through Chicago Creative 2019. This is the guy I dealt with, or this is the guy who dealt with me. He's, he saw right through me, literally. We didn't have our ups and downs, and we didn't argue a lot. But if I could say one thing, this is one man that'll put you in check real quick. You know what I'm saying? He'll, he'll make you realize what you want to do is not what you want to do. And I love him for it because he, he put me in the position of what I'm doing now. Ended up meeting Billy once I graduated, transitioned from CRED, and he connected me with the organization called Iman. And through them, I was a part of their Weekend Warriors program where I was learning a trade um, in welding. And May 24th, I graduated with my certificates. <laughs> this, past, this past May, I graduated with my advanced in MIG, TIG, and STIC welding along with some minor certifications in plasma cutting, CNC machining, um, 3D printing, and a lot more other, you know, minor certifications. So, um, and right, and once I transition from Iman, I'm currently in the process of getting my CDLs. And last question, these, to be really, these transitions, these transformations are not linear, they're not overnight. We have good days, we have tough days, these are not straight up. But I, just take a second, Aaron, because as, as you've changed and transformed, doing things different, the neighborhood still has a long way to go. You're still living in a war zone. You've been shot at multiple times, thank God you've never been, been hit, you've lost countless folks. So talk about as you're trying to move in this very different direction, how you navigate day-to-day -day reality. We talked last night about a situation two weeks ago that could have been deadly. So how do you try and move different now to stay alive? Well, since I've been on the right track, I move different. You don't see me unless I want to be seen. I'm literally a ghost, literally. But me, as far as guys living in the war zone, where guys come to Chicago, create an Iman, regardless if we're making a change 
a lot of us are still known faces. So we're working to get out of Chicago, lead the state, but we're also working to give back to our communities. So that's what we strive for. We big on change because growing up, when we hear the word opportunity and change, we kind of scared of that, you know, because we, we're not offered that, you know? So, I mean, we just move how we move, I guess. <laughs> And you guys are just getting a, a snapshot, a snippet of how deep and powerful these stories are. I want to shift to, to Billy, and Billy, you and I have an interesting and complicated history, if you want to give some folks a, of that. Um, let's, let's start there. Yeah, so um, at 16 years old, I made the worst mistake of my life. I became a perpetrator of gun violence when I unfortunately shot a 17-year-old kid who happened to be, at the time, the number one basketball player in the nation. Benji Wilson at Simeon High School, who happened to be Arnie Duncan's friend. They grew up together playing basketball. That was one of the worst mistakes I ever made in my life. And I went away for 20 years. And what I learned in those 20 years was to never have to respond to my anger, but try to be faster in my thinking. And I think that's the thing that we're trying to teach young men right now how to outthink their feelings, because if you respond to the way you feel in, in moments of crisis, you're gonna walk away with some serious regret. And we come from circumstances where there's very small margins. So once we step out of those margins, we pay a heavy price. Uh, 20 years, well, 30 some years later, um, I met Arnie at a peace rally, literally two weeks after my own son had been shot and killed. So now, having to understand what it's like to be a perpetrator of gun violence, it came full circle by understanding what it's like to be a victim of gun violence. And when I met Arnie on this peace march, I asked him, did he, did he, did he know about me? He was like, yeah, but he wanted me to tell him my story. So we talked, and actually, I started working with this organization called Iman, the Inner City Muslim Action Network, maybe a month before this peace march. I literally got hired two weeks after my son got killed. And that was what helped me deal with my grief because I knew that I was gonna be working with young men just like my son. And I had a responsibility to teach them how not to end up becoming a victim of gun violence. This work that we do is so heavy because we're dealing with young men, like Aaron said, who don't get a lot of opportunities that come their way. So they feel like the circumstances they're living in is the only thing that they got. So now we fight not just to reduce their risk of being victims of gun violence, we also fighting to help them reduce their risk of being victims of circumstances. This work is by far the most humbling work I've ever done, and you just learn so many lessons every day. But something Billy said at the time that blew me away and still blows me away, is if the young man who killed his son came into our program, that he would mentor him and take him under the wing. And if my son or daughter were killed, and I worry about them every day, I don't know if I could do that. I don't know if I'd have that in me. But talk about, and I know he meant that from his heart, and it's really, really impacted me. Talk about what you're thinking when you say that, and what do you mean? So, as a young kid at 16 years old, having committed the tragic mistake that I did that costed a young man his life and having the world just show me how much hate they had for me. And the only thing I needed people to understand was the fact that I made a mistake. I picked up a gun and I got gun problems that I couldn't get out of. So how could I be a hypocrite? The moment I found out my son had died, I knew right then and there I had to extend forgiveness to the young man who had did that because they were just caught up in the same cycle of ignorance that I was in when I was 16 years old, when I unfortunately took somebody's life. If I could do that all, all over again, I wouldn't have done that. So how can I now be committed to not making the same mistake, to try to help young men like Aaron learn how to think ahead of their problems, and if the only thing I could think about the young man who killed my son was taking their life? I would be a hypocrite, and I know that if, if these guys live long enough, they're gonna end up being able to realize what, what greatness they have inside of them. And they need people like me and Hicks to help show them that, because somebody helped show me that. And I don't wanna have them go sit 20 and 30 years of their life, you know, have, having to figure that out. So 
And I will still mentor those young men who did that to my son. We do, we do have more than our share of heartbreaking days. We also have our, more than our share of extraordinary days. And I don't say this lightly, one of the most powerful evenings of my life was the evening 34 years to the day after Billy killed Benji, where Billy reconciled with his, with his two brothers. And talk about what that experience was like. So I had done my time. I had been home close to 14 years. And a mutual friend of the Wilson brothers and myself he wanted to have us sit down and have this reconciliation. And I thought it was important for me to sit at that table and allow them to have, I wouldn't say closure, but they have grieved the loss of their brother up until that moment without having a, a, a chance to really talk to me and tell me how I made them feel. And I felt like I needed to give them that. And I've always felt like the work that I was doing with these young men if I don't teach them how to resolve their conflict and understand that for me, reconciliation is the best form of retaliation, then there was no way that I can sit at that table and not offer them some resolution. I had to take advantage of that because I'm a peacemaker right now. And we walked away from that table and one of the brothers, Anthony Wilson, told me that the reason why he was willing to talk to me because his mother actually told him right before she died that he needed to forgive me. And he told me that because I killed his brother, now I have the responsibility of being his brother. And I think that's the type of, we don't want to have these situations unfold before we teach young men how to resolve conflict without it leading to somebody losing their life. So I think I'm the biggest uh, proponent and agent for change and reconciliation. So I, it was a privilege and an honor for me to be a part of that. Um, Billy's leading all of our work with our alumni like Aaron, and we need to get him some more staff. But he also focuses on the west side, North Lawndale, which has always been the top three, four, five most violent neighborhoods in Chicago. Again, the city's down 10% this year. North Lawndale's down 50%. And what does that feel like to see the progress that we're making in North Lawndale now? So it's a good feeling, like Hiss said, because when you know these guys have went through our program and they have understand, they understand now what it's like to really just see themselves as being more than just a statistic. You know, we put flesh on statistics. When we talk about 50%, we look at people who are now at, at a lower risk of being a victim of gun violence than they were when they came to us. You know, this work, sometimes you see it in the news and you see numbers. We see people every day. So if it was 50%, if it was 5%, when I know somebody comes to work and shows up in the program every day, it's just a great feeling because I know what it's like to come to work and it's a seat empty. I've lost 10 young men in the last five years that I've worked with directly in this work and it never gets any easier. It never gets any easier. So I'm definitely gonna celebrate those numbers till we get to a point to where we don't have to worry about our young men being victims. We're just doing maintenance. And final question for each of you, and we're running out of time here, so 30 seconds each for, again, an audience where this may be a, a pretty different or foreign world. What's the most important thing you want them to take away from this conversation? Let's start with you first. Uh, the most important thing I want you to take from this is, is uh, do your resources. Um, all we ask for is like referrals. These guys need a different environment. If they're able to move out to the city of Chicago, be somewhere else safe and work, you just have to give them the opportunity. And for those who have opportunities, just reach out to us so we help some of these young men save some lives. Um, I would say for any of you guys who are close with anyone in my generation, I'll be 26 this year. Um, for my generation, just try to get them to trust you. Let them know that you can trust, you know what I'm saying, the people that's trying to help you. Because, you know, we've been lied to our whole lives as far as trust. So that's one big thing we need to take a big step, big step in that direction, is to get the younger generation to trust. I would say never be too quick to judge if you're not willing to help.
Thanks so much for having us. Just two quick final thoughts. People often say it's great you're giving guys a second chance. I reject, I think in most cases, we're giving them a first chance and that sort of every structure in their life, family, school, community failed them and we're giving them a chance late in life, a second chance. Um, and the second thing is hopefully get a sense that I think our young men aren't the problem, they're the solution to the problem. And those closest to these cycles of violence, the Mr. Hicks of the world, the Billy Moores of the world, our other life coach and outreach workers, they are uniquely positioned to help mentor Aaron and his generation grow. And without their leadership, without their commitment, we can't get there. But with their leadership, we have a chance to do something that's transformative. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Katie Couric and it's great to be with all of you today. Um, we have a terrific panel. Like most of you, I have been awed by the courage and determination of the Ukrainian people as they begin the fifth week, or the fifth month rather, of uh, defending themselves against the Russian invasion of their country. I've also been awed by the courage of the journalists on the ground continuing to cover this harrowing and heartbreaking story, despite the very real and often grave risks to their personal safety. So I'm thrilled to be joined by three amazing women who've been covering the war, as well as many other conflicts during the course of their careers. Mary Louise Kelly is co-host of NPR's All Things, Things Considered and previously spent a decade as national security correspondent for NPR News. Aaron McLaughlin is a correspondent for NBC News and has been reporting from different locations across uh, Ukraine and Eastern Europe since January. And Aaron Grace Treve is a photojournalist whose work has been featured in the New York Times, Rolling Stone, Time Magazine, Harper's, and many other publications. Please welcome them to the stage. <laughs> So today marks the 125th day of uh, this, this war, of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. All three of you have spent time on the front lines, although really the front lines is almost an outdated moniker at this point, covering the devastating conflict. So first and foremost, I just want to ask each of you, why do you do what you do, considering the, the tremendous danger involved? And Mary Louise, we'll start with you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I, it is, I mean, it's strange, isn't it? The, the impulse that I guess we share that when the bomb goes off, when the tanks roll over the border, most people are running the other way and first responders and journalists are running toward it. Um, and I am not crazy brave. And I'm not crazy. I'm a mom. I have kids. I want to come home. I think for me, it comes down to a question that probably we all ask ourselves all the time that, you know, what do, I have this one life, what do I want to do with it? What looks like a meaningful life to me? Um, and if my teenage kids were here, they would keep you here all night telling you all the things I am not good at that I don't know how to do. The list is long. But lead a team to a conflict zone, start setting up interviews, interview everybody in sight from the guy who you buy a sandwich from on the street to government ministers and start telling their stories so that you at home have a sense of what's happening in a country and the stories that are happening to its people. Um, I know how to do that. This is something I can do. And at a moment with Ukraine where we were all looking with horror thinking, oh my God, like how can I help? What can I do? This is something I can do. So it happens and you think, I. I can't imagine not saying, put me in, coach. What about you, Aaron? Well, I knew from a very young age that I wanted to be a journalist. This is my passion. This is very much a part of who I am. When I was a young student reporter in college, I remember covering a protest that got violent, and the protesters, the student protesters were clashing with the police officers on campus and I inadvertently ended up getting thrown to the ground and I remember in that moment thinking I need to get up 
and I need to report and tell this story. And I never felt more alive in my entire life. And it was in that moment that I knew that this was my calling. And I carried that forward throughout my career. I am fascinated by international news. I love traveling to different countries and learning about different cultures and different people. I wanted to be an international journalist. And the sad fact is going to war zones, covering conflict is a huge part of that. And you can't pick and choose what stories you want to cover, what stories you want to be a part of. So it became sort of a byproduct of what I want to do with my life in a way. Aaron T versus Aaron M, what about you? Yes, um, I think my feeling is really similar to Aaron M's. Um, I knew at a young age that this was something that I wanted to do. And I recently actually saw a quote by Joan of Arc that said, I'm not afraid, I was born to do this. And it just resonated with, with me and, and where my heart is because um, when I was 19, I, I felt a calling, um, for lack of a better word, to, to do this type of work and to be in the center of where the story is and to be with the people. Um, as a photojournalist, you have to be close. You know, I can't report um, Sometimes I wish I could report from home, but, but I can't. I have to be there in front of the action in order to make those pictures. And, um, you know, for me, just the rewarding experience and what I get from bonding with people, being on the front lines, sharing their story, it's a complete privilege. And I don't think I would be able to do any other line of work. Mary Louise, as we take a look at some photos of you working really all over the world, um, Tell us how being a female war correspondent has impacted your experience and the stories that you've told through the years. Hmm. Um, I mean, the short answer is it, it kind of hasn't. And I don't mean to sound naive, but I think I cover, you know, the same stories in a similar way as a lot of my male colleagues in a place like Ukraine where we can both, you know, operate. It's different from Afghanistan or other places where that's a somewhat different situation. But I guess the slightly longer answer is I'm sure that I see stories that my male colleagues do not see and vice versa. Um, I'm thinking of one recently from Ukraine. Uh, this was an NPR team. My colleague Leila Fadel had gone in. This was in the worst days of the war in, or in March, late March. and. Um, she filed a story from a nail salon in Kyiv because she was wandering past and thought, is that actually open? Are there women actually in there? And she peeked in and there are indeed women and they're getting their nails done. And she, you know, I, I can picture the male editors back at headquarters rolling their eyes saying, we sent you to a war zone and you are filing from a nail salon? Are you effing kidding me? Um, however, the story was she went in, and, and the women in there felt kind of the same. Like, I get that this is frivolous. I get that many of my countrymen are out fighting on the front lines right now, and I'm in here worrying about, am I going to do bright pink or sky blue today on my nails? But it was a personal stand of defiance, is the way one woman explained it to NPR, was saying, Vladimir Putin has taken so much from us. He has ruined everything. He is not taking this little moment of pleasure and beauty and joy from me. So this is what I'm doing today is, you know, painting my nails blue and giving a little F you to Vladimir Putin <laughs> and, um, in my bright blue. And I thought, I get it. You go, girl. And that is a story that I'm sure my male colleagues who were on the ground would have walked right past, never seen, never told you, but it brought to life. This is... This is a moment yeah. that it's hard to capture otherwise. Something that might have seemed frivolous was actually an act of defiance in yeah. a way. Meanwhile, Aaron, you and, and so many others who have been covering this war have made the point of getting the story right. Um, I think we have a video of you in action, so let's take a quick look. Let's get right to Aaron McLaughlin in Ukraine. We've heard a number of explosions in Kyiv, the capital. Here the sirens are sounding thousands and there's mass confusion. People don't know where to go. This is still a functioning metro station, yet for so many people here, it's the only place they can go when the sirens go off. Now, as you can see, this was the scene of a ferocious battle. The ground is littered with glass, explosives, 
thick in the air. Now the Ukrainians are hitting back any way they can, including from the sky. Without this drone, without this capability, could you have won the battle for Kyiv? Yeah. Ukraine is strong, he says. You're very strong. I'd love that drone shot, by the way. But when you talk about doing it right, how hard is it to cover this story, to do it right and to do it at all? Can you just talk about some of the challenges of being on the ground in Ukraine day in and day night? day out? Well, I think the biggest challenge is obviously the security situation. Covering a conflict is inherently dangerous, but covering Ukraine, I would argue, as a journalist and as an American journalist is even more so. And it would be my worst nightmare to become a part of the story in any way, shape, or form. So it is a huge part of my job to stay safe. And in order to do that, sometimes you have to make tough coverage decisions. Um, for example, you, you don't want to be in the direct line of artillery fire. You don't want to go into an area where there's active Russian troops. You don't want to be kidnapped by those Russian troops. You don't want to be a part of the story. So it's really limiting what we can do, what I can do, what my team can do once we're on the ground in Ukraine. But that doesn't mean that telling powerful stories, telling important stories is impossible. Um, when I was there, my last what we call rotation, um, Mariupol was in the headlines, absolutely devastated. The, the journalists could not get into that city anymore. It was completely, pretty much for the exception of an old steel plant taken over by Russian forces. The Associated Press was reporting, they were the last team there to report, they were saying they were actively being hunted by Russian soldiers, they had to leave. So there was a huge void, we did not know. We still do not know what's going on in Mariupol. So how do you get to that story? How do you tell that story in a compelling and meaningful way? And you have to get creative and you have to work hard. I remember one day I was scrolling on Twitter and I saw one tweet from an, a Ukrainian activist about a photo of a little boy's diary, a nine-year-old boy who was trapped in Mariupol, and someone photographed his diary, and in the diary entry, he said, my city is dead. Just a hugely powerful image in and of itself, this photo of this diary. So working with the local journalists on my team, we tracked down the photographer, and by a stroke of luck, the photographer had just escaped Mariupol and had just arrived in Kyiv. And I'm like, we have to get, we, we need to get in the car and we need to go. And we, we went to his apartment building, we sat down with him, and that photographer had a whole treasure trove of still images that he had taken in Mariupol when no one could get to that story. It's an example of the kinds of ways, the kinds of things you need to do, the creative thinking involved, the luck, in, in, a, in order to be able to, sit, to show what's happening behind the scenes and to tell a compelling story. How, how creative and intrepid you have to be to get the story. And Aaron, talk about images. You know, we've seen so many just uh, devastating photos. And I imagine for someone like you, a photojournalist, it's sensory overload. How do you decide and, and what guides you and makes you gravitate to certain images that you want to preserve? Yeah, you know, I mean, it, it depends on the, the Actually, content. and we have some photos uh, that we're, you're going to tell us a little bit about them. Yeah, I, um, I know that the emphasis is on Ukraine today since that is, is the most recent conflict and it's ongoing. But I also included some of my work here from Syria and Iraq because I think it's important to remember that there are other conflicts going on in the world presently. Um, so, for instance, uh, this was in 2014, uh, or 15, I'm sorry, in Iraq, when ISIS was controlling uh, large swaths of the country. And on the left, you can see women who were forced to dress in a full niqab without even being able to show their eyes. And on the right were some of their daughters who this village had just been liberated. Um, I think it was two days they had been liberated from I ISIS control. And so these girls next door are waving to their neighbors who they hadn't seen in over a year because the women were forced to stay inside and to hide um, and to keep themselves completely covered. So they were 
overwhelmed with joy um, upon seeing their friends and their neighbors. And then if we go to the next slide, um, this was uh, some of more, my most recent work in Ukraine. On the left is a woman named Taria, who I met in the subway. I'm sure many of you saw images of families hunkering down in subways from missile strikes. And she had her two small children with her. And to the right is her husband, who had joined the ter territorial defense, which was Ukrainians' volunteer um, army unit. And she told me later, I did a, a larger expose on her and spent several days with her. She told me later that her husband didn't ask her permission to join, or it wasn't even a conversation. And I think this was the case for a lot of Ukrainian women. They didn't have a lot of choices. You know, the husbands were forced to stay in Ukraine, those that were of fighting age, and hers joined the military without having a conversation about who was going to take care of the kids. So as a female, as a mother, as a woman in Ukraine, a lot of women were under such pressure and stress to keep their families together and, uh, and alive. Um, and on the right is a photograph that I took in a maternity ward in a hospital where women who were eight to nine months pregnant, some were about to give birth, were bas basically sheltering in the basement. Some were sleeping on concrete floors with foam pads maybe a couple inches thick. Um, some were going into labor while the alarms all over Kiev were uh, sounding to alert people of missile strikes. And what I found that was just really incredible to me was that there was such a heightened level of stoicism. Ukrainian women were so fierce and brave and, um, you know, there weren't many complaints. They were just kind of like, this is what we have to do. We have to give birth and take care of our children under these circumstances. And that to me was just harrowing and inspiring to, to be a part of that and to be able to tell those stories. Are there certain stories that you feel like in all the conflicts that you all have covered that you're more sensitized to because you are women and that perhaps your male counterparts, I mean, Mary Louise, you gave the example of the nail salon, which ended up being incredibly revealing and, and an important story. But are there other examples where your presence is so critically important because your eyes, and you, may, you just may be more aware of certain stories that might not be traditional war stories? I mean, I'm happy to, I'll take that from two directions. One is just, you know, your phot photography from Iraq is a reminder. I always feel so fortunate to be a woman because in a place like that, I have access to half the population that is closed off to my male colleagues. They can't get behind the scenes in countries like Afghanistan, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, Iraq. I mean, you know, so many countries that, uh, Half the population are cut off, and my male colleagues cannot reach them for the most part, and we can, and that is a privilege to be able to tell those stories on top of all the others. Um, I'll tell one quick story from Ukraine uh, that gets, I think, to what you're, you're uh, hinting at, which is there's how I th cover things as a woman, there's how I cover things as a mom that may resonate with parents here. One of the interviews that I will always remember from Ukraine was with this MP had chaired the Foreign Affairs Committee, um, was one of the original leaders of the Euromaidan revolution that toppled the government in 2014. This fierce woman, who I was a little scared of, and she's talking about what scares her um, as her country is about to be, you know, decimated by Russia. And she said the single biggest worry on her mind the day I interviewed her was her 11-year-old daughter had been begging for a pet, specifically a guinea pig. And she really wanted to get her the guinea pig, but she was like, you know, if they start bombing Kiev and we have to evacuate, and I got to pack all the suitcases and my daughter and everything, like, I'm going to be stuck trying to evacuate a rodent on a train with the cage, with the food, with the water bottle, the, you know, all of it. Like, this is crazy. But my daughter's earned this guinea pig. She got really good grades, and Vladimir Putin shouldn't be able to. This is his fault, not hers. Why should she suffer? So she was really, she started crying as she's telling me this. She was so stressed out, and I started crying, and I started thinking, before I was a mom, I would have interrupted her and said, 
Yeah, 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 but back, let's talk about the important stuff. Let's talk sanctions, let's talk NATO, let's talk weapons movements. You know, this is a continent's armies on the march. Back to, back to what matters here, lady. And the mom and me sitting there weeping along with her over this guinea pig is thinking, this is the, this is the story. Like, this is the important stuff. This is what you will remember from this interview. And when the bombs do start falling on Kyiv, you're going to be thinking, where's that little girl? Where's the guinea pig? Did they make it out? Aaron, what about when you come home from these horrific places that also have beautiful moments of humanity and commonality, but do you have nightmares? Do you suffer from T PTSD? I mean, what is it like for you after you see almost the unseeable and, and you have to kind of absorb that and go back to the creature comforts of living in Los Angeles? I would say this rotation, I was more affected than my first rotation. My first rotation, it was hugely adrenaline driven. I was there three weeks prior to the invasion. So I really got a sense of the people, the country, um, I really got to know them, and I took that three weeks. I think it was absolutely, absolutely essential to, to my reporting. And then I was there for a couple weeks after the invasion itself, the shock of it all, the horror. But the true extent of the horror wasn't revealed, really, until the Russians pulled out of Bucha and out of the Kyiv region. And then we saw the really ugly, horrifying face of this war. The world, the world got to see it. I arrived shortly after uh, the Russians withdrew. So knowing what was going on when I was reporting from Kyiv itself, it was too dangerous for us to be able to reach some of these Russian-occupied areas. So knowing that this was happening as I was in relative, there's nowhere safe in Ukraine, but in comparative safety in Kyiv really did weigh on me. And, and meeting the victims really did weigh on me this time around. The, the little boy at the end of the clip um, of, that, of that reel, he's six years old. He lost his mom to stress and starvation in Bucha. She died in the bunker. And um, I was there as she received her proper burial. But while the Russians were occupying, they buried her in the backyard. And every day, Vlad would go out and sit with his mom. So... It does impact you, and it's really important when you come out of a war zone, especially that second time for me around, that I speak to people um, and help process those, those feelings. Erin, you, you started something called the Homecoming Project, which basically chronicles the effects of PTSD on military combatants, so you know a lot about the topic. And you, too, have suffered from it as well. Tell us about your experience. Yeah, I, um, after covering conflict for, I think, the first seven years, um, I was diagnosed with PTSD, and it didn't occur to me, I mean, you know, you know that you're going to be affected by what you're seeing, but you don't, I didn't really understand the repercussions and how it would affect the rest of my life. And um, luckily, I've, I've got great therapist and a great support network, and I found a lot of ways to cope with the aftermath. Um, meditation is one of them, um, which uh, Dan Harris also, <laughs> as a reporter, talks about. But yeah, you know, I think um, it, it's impossible to do our job properly without being affected. I mean, an emotional connection to the people that we're reporting on is essential in order to tell their story properly and levels of empathy and compassion. Um, at the same time, you can get so involved in, in their lives and involved in the story that it can sweep you away. And it's a really tricky tightrope to walk um, between you know doing your job properly and being overwhelmed by it. Caring, but not caring so much. Right. Um, in the two minutes we have left, you know, there's so much going on in the world, 24-7 news cycle. We are just overwhelmed with news and information all the time. You don't need me to tell you everything that's going on in the world and in this country. Don't get me started. So how do you keep people caring 
about what is happening in Ukraine because I think people's, people's attention spans are short and their interest has started to wane. So real quickly, let me just go down the line. Mary Louise, what would you say? I mean, this is the challenge. This is the challenge, and this is, this is the natural sweep of every story. It's front page until it's not, until something bigger, more awful, more you know, immediately demanding of our attention takes over. Sadly, we have some practice from covering Iraq, from covering Afghanistan, you know, conflicts that have gone on, went on for years and years and years and cycled in and out of the lead headlines. They used to call Afghanistan the forgotten war. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, there were moments when I was coming out of Afghanistan when it, you came home and told people where you'd been and they were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Next. Um, so far, that has not been the experience in Ukraine, but I think we are at a moment where it's shifting, and I, I don't know. I don't have a great answer other than that it's finding, it is finding the humanity. Um, I'm, I'm an optimist on, on this level. I think there will always be appetite for the Ukraine story, especially at the network where I work. I think the stakes are too great. Um, the world cannot ignore what's happening there, and I think there is going to be interest um, I'm confident that there will be interest. It's our job as journalists to find those really powerful, impactful stories, to figure out how to get behind the scenes in those Russian-occupied areas to do the story justice as journalists. And we were talking backstage about how Ukraine is different than Afghanistan, even Iraq, because there's a common enemy and there might be a bit of racism at play, too, in terms of the empathy we feel with the Ukrainian people versus, say, Afghanistan, Iraq, and other countries. Um, Aaron, tell me about your plans and how you hope to keep people engaged on this war. Yeah, I mean, I've worked, um, Iraq and Afghanistan have, have been the two countries I've concentrated most on over the past 10 years, and that's where I've gained the most experience having to retell stories over and over again and keep people engaged and, and interested. And with Ukraine, it's it's not dissimilar. I mean, I, there was a huge flood of, of a Western interest, and especially from America in the beginning. And we all know as journalists that stories tend to fall off the front page after two to three months. And so I, I do feel like it's our job to keep people interested, engaged. And, and to do that, you have to get creative, you know, try to talk and tell stories about things that haven't been covered, access people who, who haven't necessarily been able to, to get their stories out there. Um, it's definitely a challenge, but you know I think this is what we all signed up for. And I think clearly you all three are up to the challenge. Aaron Treve, Aaron McLaughlin, Mary Louise Kelly, thank you all so much, and thank you for your great work. Thank you, everyone. Uh, hi, I'm Jeff Goldberg. I'm the editor-in-chief of The Atlantic. Um, and uh, very, very happy to be back. Very happy to see all of you. Um, this has been a very exciting uh, program so far. Uh, gun violence, uh, war reporting. This panel is going to be much more exciting. <laughs> What we're, what we're doing today is we're going to have a Democrat and a Republican talk to each other. Um, maybe, maybe. Maybe <laughs> we, we have a security plan in case it goes off the rails, but um, not only, by the way, not only do we have a Democrat and a Republican talking to each other, they are talking today about the most electrifying subject in American life, infrastructure. Um, so welcome to Infrastructure Week at Aspen. We've been waiting for many years. Um, uh, we have Senator Rob Portman of Ohio, uh, and uh, we have Mitch Landrieu, former mayor of New Orleans, currently... That's the, the, 
It's organized geographically. Um, uh, and currently, the, I, I want to call you infrastructure czar, but czar has an even uh, kind of uh, odor, <laughs> bigger odor than usual, so we'll just call you the infrastructure coordinator. Yeah, Mitch would be good. Mitch? I can't because I have such great respect for the United States Senate that I have to call him Senator Portman until he retires. So I'm going to call you Mayor Landrieu. Just, just deal with it. It's going to be okay. Um, I, I want to. We're going to. We're going to talk about bridges and tunnels in a second. Um, but I, I have to. I have to raise a a subject. I, I, those of you who are out having a nice picnic may not have seen uh, some of the testimony today in the uh, uh, January 6 hearings. Um, there were some really remarkable things said today by uh, a woman named Cassidy Hutchinson, who was uh, an aide to uh, the former White House Chief of Staff, Mark Meadows. Um, uh, it's, it's um, even by the standards of what we come to expect, it's pretty extraordinary. Uh, it, according to Cassidy Hutchinson, Donald Trump was told that uh, some of the crowd had weapons at, on January 6th, and he said, I quote, I don't fucking care that they have weapons. They aren't here to hurt me. Take the fucking mags away. And mags is a reference to the uh, magnetometers, the um, uh, metal detectors. Um, according to Cassidy Hutchinson, Trump tried to grab the steering wheel of his limousine to get it to go to the Capitol and physically laid hands on a Secret Service agent who refused. Um, and he also, according to this testimony, um, said directly to, to Meadows that uh, Mike Pence did deserve to be hanged. Um, and so I have to, since it would be a dereliction of duty not to raise this with Senator Portman and being mindful of the fact no, 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 no. Being mindful of the fact that Senator Portman is also retiring from the United States Senate, I do want to ask you, I do want to ask you directly, Given what you know now about what happened on January 6th, do you regret your vote to acquit in impeachment? So we have 25 minutes to talk about infrastructure. Oh. Um, That's not... It's something that deserves two or three hours. You can... And you have just surprised me, even though we just spent 20 minutes together back there. Um, you could have mentioned it, Jeff. What? And uh, even though you know that I spoke out in the strongest possible terms about you did. what happened to, to on be January fair, 6th, you called it inexcusable, what and, Trump did. And long before that, I said the election was over. And on the night it happened, I took to the Senate floor and gave an impassioned speech about democracy and the need to protect it. So that's who I am. But no change in feelings about what happened. In the impeachment, well, what do you, I mean, your, your argument during impeachment, okay. after impeachment, was you can't impeach. When do we get our 25 minutes on infrastructure? No, 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 no does, don't worry, does, does, don't worry. Does, does, we're going to, I'm going to switch, and we're going to talk about bridges about, in Ohio. So, do you think it would be a good idea for President Obama to be impeached by the new Republican Congress? No. Well, he's a former president, and I think he should be out of reach. And Donald Trump was a former president, and if you, if you, if you. If you start that precedent, trust me, Republicans will do the same thing. They will. And, no, that's an interesting point. And it, an and interesting it, point to make. And when you look at the Constitution and what it says with regard to impeachment, it is meant to deal with current office holders. There's no question about that in my mind. So, again, it was great being with you all. <laughs> Thank you very much. But uh, I, I will switch. Next but time, maybe give me a little warning no, about no, that. No, no, now. no, no, no. Huh? We're all grown-ups here, yeah. and 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 we can. And well, you're some an of us are. And yeah. you're an elected official, and you can answer these kind of questions. I think it's 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 incumbent on journalists to ask. It's incumbent on on elected officials to answer. But I will switch, and I will say this: that you are also one of the Republicans in the Senate who still works with Democrats. Um, there are some Democrats who don't work with Republicans anymore, and I want you two to discuss these, the, the issue of infrastructure. It's interesting in and of itself, obviously, spending a trillion dollars to rebuild America, roads, bridges, tunnels, airports. Um, but this is also a very, very interesting subject because it's one of the only areas where Republicans and Democrats are still working together. Before we go to Mitch to talk about how he's gonna spend $1.2 trillion, um, we want to go to you to talk about why you decided to actually work with the Democrats when, when cross-aisle cross cooperation seems mostly, to, to most of us, a thing of the past. Well, right thing to do, but remember the context was that President Biden had proposed a 
$6.5 trillion package called infrastructure. And I saw it as an opportunity, as did Kirsten Sinema, senator from Arizona. So we decided on a bipartisan basis to see whether we could pull out the core infrastructure from that legislation uh, and then work with some colleagues and see whether we could do it without raising taxes because it also had the largest tax increase in American history and also do it without going to our leadership, but rather from the middle out, which is how the Senate used to operate. So as Republicans and Democrats, we grew it from there. We found four colleagues on each side, four Republicans, four Democrats, along with the two of us, five and five, and we started working on it. And 20 times the media reported us uh, to be failing and uh, felt like Mark Twain, you know, my death was greatly exaggerated. Uh, but we figured it out just by sticking to our principles, which was core infrastructure only, no new taxes, pay for it through other ways, and do it as a truly bipartisan exercise where we weren't looking for permission from our leadership, but we were moving ahead. In the end, uh, despite the opposition of President Trump, which made it very difficult, frankly, to get Republicans, uh, we ended up with about 18 Republicans supporting that. And as a result, all Democrats supported. As a result, we got something done that was huge and great for the American people, the biggest infrastructure package since the interstate highway system. And it was more than that. I mean, it was about showing the country that we could get something done that was big. Five presidents had talked about this. Every president had had infrastructure week. That was the joke, um, and uh, including Republican and Democrat presidents. and. We also had, had five Congresses say they were going to do it, and, and they could never get it done. This seemed to me to be the time that, one, we needed to do something important for the public good, for public works, which were badly needed because America has fallen behind on infrastructure, as you probably know. And second, that it, it was an opportunity for us to actually do something that um, transcended politics, in my view. It was almost nonpartisan rather than bipartisan. Well, I'll come to mention one second, but can I ask you this? If you hadn't been an, uh, retiring from the Senate, would you have been able to do this? Or would you have taken on, obviously in the current political climate, a very, very difficult task of going against even many Republicans in Ohio who didn't want you to do this? Yeah, I think, I think we had two Republicans from Ohio supported it in the end, but most didn't. And again, it was difficult for them because President Trump came out strongly against it, uh, as did others, even though President Trump, you may recall, was one of those five presidents. He had proposed his own infrastructure package, which was just as large, I would argue even larger. Mm -hmm. And it really begun a discussion among Republicans and Democrats, which was positive. But the, one of the issues was whether people wanted to give President Biden a victory or not. And which is what I heard when I, of course, called my colleagues, including the former president, and said, hey, you know, this is good stuff, and you should be for it, and it's consistent with what you talked about. And the answer was, you're giving President Biden a victory. This is an American victory. It was not about politics. The, the one thing that, that made it easier for me to do it is that, um, as Jane can tell you, who's here in the audience, I spent, you know, weeks in Washington without coming home, which I never like to do. And um, it was, you know, it just took a lot of time and effort over a year's worth of work. So that would have been more difficult had I been campaigning back home nonstop. Right. You're also a politician. Mitch. We, we're not talking to him anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no, by the way. It's, no, it's a, go ahead, give me. I'm it's always great when Democrats. It's anyway. always great when Democrats go for cheap anti-press populism. By the way, I always enjoy it. Um, it's easy. Uh, we love you, Mitch. Yes, you did it. What? You call me Mitch. I know. I know. I can't help it. I love that. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Mitch. Mr. Uh, Mitch to you, Mitch. Be, I want you to talk about infrastructure as the technocrat now in charge of infrastructure. But but you're also a politician. Analyze what he's saying from a political standpoint and, and talk about it through your current experience. I will. Are you finding it possible to work with Republicans? Um, how, what, are, what are the particular difficulties? What are the difficulties that exist now that might not have existed in the past? All right. Two editorial comments. Um, first, Arnie and his team that were out here, that's God's work. It's unbelievable. Um, just to keep. Just to keep in your head as a data point, over 600,000 people have lost their lives 
to guns uh, since 1980 in the United States of America, which is, of course, if you count more than all the soldiers that have, American soldiers, that have lost their lives in all of the wars of the 20th and the 21st century. And those guys are unbelievable heroes. And I know the work that they're doing there. It's actually tied to the infrastructure bill, and I'll talk to that um, in a second. Um, the second thing is um, the senator's retiring. He and his family have um, sacrificed a lot of years of their life to be in public service, and everybody that knows Rob Portman knows that he's a stand-up guy. And I just wanted to thank him for his service. And, um, and, to, and to, to go to the, the question that Jeffrey asked, um, when President Biden was running for office, he said, look, I'm gonna use the power of my presidency to try to calm the United States of America, to try to get us into to a transition or into a growth period historically, and use my power to bring people together. And as the senator said, what better way to do that is to put money in the bank to build a bridge. That's essentially what the infrastructure bill does, and that's the big idea. And the president articulates it as giving us a chance as Americans to figure out in all of this agony that we happen to be in at the moment for lots of different reasons, that we can actually find common ground and do big things again. And this bill would not have gotten passed if, um, if Rob and some other uh, Republican senators, I think 13 Republicans, is that right, voted for it. Um, but it wouldn't have happened because the way Congress works, there wasn't much bipartisan discussion. And so it really was a bipartisan effort to write the bill, to draft the bill, to negotiate the bill. Writing a bill is like watching sausage being made. The president wanted a much higher number. Um, some other folks wanted a much lower number. Everybody wanted different kind of stuff in it. But it ended up a $1.2 trillion investment, the largest investment since um, the interstate on roads, bridges, airports, ports, waterways, high-speed internet across all of America, clean air, clean water, and essentially the, the, um, the seeds of what is gonna be a very robust clean energy economy. And that is what they were able to do. And so I, I didn't get there till after it was done. I didn't have anything to do with it. Um, yeah, re and, re and resilience, teaching people how to, how to build back strong so that when the bad stuff comes, you can actually survive it, which is a smarter way to build. But my job is to try to get the money down to the ground. And so the president has charged me with pulling together all the cabinet secretaries. We've met 14 times, meeting with all the inspector generals to make sure the money's spent well meeting with all the permitting people at, at this guy's request who rides me like a wet mule and says, you gotta, you gotta get stuff built because it takes us too long and it costs too much. Now, it doesn't matter what side of the aisle you're on. You have to think that we can do better and faster in the country. And so my job in order to implement the president's big idea of bringing the country together is also to talk to all 50 governors, which I have done. And I, and I have to tell you how pleasantly surprised I have been um, although I shouldn't be, because Nancy Pelosi told me they voted no, but they want the dough. <laughs> and, uh, as a, and so it's not a surprise, and you see this all over the country with governors and, and mayors who may not have felt for whatever reason that they wanted to be for the bill. Nobody wants to turn down a dollar to fill a pothole, to build a bridge, to clean water, to lay down high-speed internet, or, by the way, electrical vehicle charging stations to get us ready for all the new electric cars that all of you guys are gonna be driving in the not too distant future. Good. You, you've alluded to something about this, this process that makes it somewhat easy in terms of cross-party cooperation, which is that you are Santa Claus in some ways. It's very, very hard. Look, oh, you know, we, we were talking about a bridge in, in Ohio that's gonna cost almost $3 billion to, to build. Obviously, people in Ohio, Kentucky, regardless of party, want the money to take a bad bridge and turn it back into a good bridge. Um, the question is, and, it's a, and it's, a, it's a more general political question, can you, what can you translate from this functional process, the things that haven't functioned so well, in terms of cross-party cooperation, or log jams in Congress? Right, well, I hope that we when can- there's not so much money to hand out. Well, that's, it, it's always easier when there's money. There's no question about it. It depends on what kind of problem you're trying to solve. When I took over as mayor of New Orleans, we had a massive deficit. My mission was to bring the city out of having a deficit. There are some governors that go into office now and they have a surplus and their job is to spend that money well. 
and to do it in a way that prepares us for the 21st century. So the mission for us right now together is how we use this incredible opportunity to build a foundation so that we all can win the economy of the 21st century when we're competing with China and when we're battling with Russia. There's also a battle going on and everybody in national security will tell you, if we're not strong at home, if we don't have the foundation at home, we don't have the ability to be strong abroad. So that what we're doing here is critically important, not just for providing high paying jobs, but for our national security as well. And so my job is actually um, not giving out money. The governors and the mayors are gonna build 90% of this. It's trying to help them frame up what the vision is that's consistent with the folks where they live, need, in order to build the bridge, right? Clean up the water, get the port moving so we can get ships to shore faster or get the airports. You talked about LaGuardia last night. Y'all seen the new LaGuardia airport? Kennedy's coming. Portland, Oregon's got a new airport. You're gonna see a lot of your airports getting shinier and better over time. And to get that money down to the ground so that we the people can understand that we actually can do big things together that help us all. That's the idea, and it's a good one. I want to jump off that and ask Senator Portman a question because this is more than, obviously the number one concern is making sure that bridges and tunnels work. They're safe for people to use. Airports are safe for people to use. You talked about, uh, uh, but there's something, there's something bigger than that, national self-image. And I'm wondering if you could talk about infrastructure in that sense. I, we were talking about LaGuardia, and I don't know if you've been, le, this is a strange statement to make, but LaGuardia is the most optimistic place in America right now. You go in and you, you, go in and you realize that we can still make things. We can still build large things, public things. Uh, talk about this in terms of national self-image. Obviously, the mood in the country for manifold reasons is tense uh, and, and, and unhappy two years of the pandemic. Uh, what, is the, what is the larger meaning of infrastructure repair for you? Well, first, because you mentioned Brent Smith Ridge, you think I'm going to just leave that one? I mean, I have to hit it. Um, for 30 years now, I've been complaining about this bridge that is between Cincinnati and Newport, Kentucky, and every one of those five presidents I talked about has had his photo taken in front of that bridge as a photo op to say, I'm going to fix this. And uh, T Tell us what's wrong with it. I, I've done it a few times myself. Um, <laughs> it's, it's the confluence of I-71 and 75. So the, the two highways come together, and suddenly you're on a bridge that is, has fewer lanes than either highway has, to the point that there is no shoulder left on the bridge because people have tried to expand it as much as possible, which makes it very unsafe. So if you have a flat tire, good luck. We had an accident recently with two trucks that collided, and it took really three or four weeks to clean up the mess. Um, it also is carrying more than twice as many cars or trucks as it was ever designed to carry. But $3 billion is a lot of money, and state and local funds have not been adequate to deal with it. It is a national project, and my hope is, having helped them apply for two of Mitch's grants that, that we provided for him, uh, and about to apply for the third one, which was legislation that I had drafted even before the infrastructure bill to help situations like this, major bridges of national importance, that will actually be able to get most of the funding, not all of it, some will be state and local, but it's the first time we've had any hope, and up to 80% could come out of this bill. So it's an example of something that has become a poster child kind of of the infrastructure problem we have in this country. The World Economic Forum does a survey every year they're probably competitive with Aspen and Ideas Institute, sorry, but, you know. but uh, you guys are going to do your own survey, I'm sure, too. But the survey says, you know, how are you doing on various uh, sectors of the economy or competitiveness or infrastructure? The U.S. lands somewhere between 12 and 16, depending on the year. Last year, I think we were 13 or 14th in the, in the world. So we, we are falling behind. We are given a C plus, uh, a grade that I used to see sometimes in college. I'm sure Mitch never did. Uh, but you don't want that. That's from the Society of, of American Engineers. So we, we have a problem, which is it's very difficult to, to find the resources to do something like infrastructure. It's long term. Uh, it will help the economy because it makes the economy more efficient. Think about this bridge. Every day there are endless traffic jams on this bridge. A lot of freight goes through there, 3% of America's GDP. This will make our economy more efficient, therefore more productive, which is counterinflationary, which is the kind of thing we ought to be doing. So I, it makes a lot of sense. I, I wanted to ask the inflation question. Uh, the number one concern of the Biden administration is inflation, not infrastructure right now. How do you guarantee that this massive infusion of cash 
into these communities isn't going to just accelerate. And, and Senator Portman is obviously an expert on this. He can jump in. Well, again, just to, I'll get to that question in just a second. But just to, to, on top of what Senator Portman said, just think about how aggravating it is when you're sitting in traffic and you're trying to get to work or you're trying to get to school or you're trying to go to synagogue or church. How much time and effort it's going to save if the rail system works better. This is all about making everybody's lives better and easier. People that don't have access to high-speed internet. There are actually places in America, you guys, where people have raw sewage in their yard that don't have running water. In Lowndes County, uh, Alabama, you see that. And then all over the country, coal country, lots of these things are they're designed to improve people's lives and make the, the value of their lives go up and the cost of their lives go down. So inflation is everybody's first concern. The president works on it every day. The other day, as you know, he was talking to uh, the Fed and said, look, it's your job you know, to do this, be smart, be thoughtful, get after it. You have the independence to do what it is that you need to do. He's called on Congress to pass legislation that reduces the cost of prescription drugs and health care and trying to make everybody's lives easier. We have reduced the deficit in the last year and a half, a larger amount that has been done really in, 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 in time that you can remember. So the president's uh, working on that. On the infrastructure piece, though, and I, I, I think you agree with me. I don't want to put words in your mouth. Um, but this is not going to be inflationary because this is a long haul. There are things that are happening right now. There are 5,000 projects that are going on in 3,200 counties. That little roundabout down there that's getting worked on, that's one of the projects. There are thousands of those. I'm going to Denver tomorrow to, to break ground on a, on a construction part on a bridge and do some stuff at the airport. And by the way, the New Orleans airport's really nice too, by the, so that y'all know. But, but I think most people who have been watching this know that this spend is going to be over time. And it's meant to be over time because it takes time to build a bridge, especially the bridge that he's talking about. The Brent Spence Bridge is a critical bridge because it connects two, two states. You have the same thing um, with a number of bridges around the country. For those of you that, that are on the Amtrak, that are jumping up and down the Northeast Corridor, Amtrak's got $65 billion to deal with that and some other high-speed rail things on the West Coast, on the Southern Coast, um, and on that coast. All of these things are going to be invested in over time. And so the inflationary pressure is not going to be part of, in a big way, the discussion that we're going through right now about the challenges that, that we're all worried about. Can you give us 30 seconds more on inflation, if you could, and how this doesn't hurt us in inflation? Well, in inflation is a function of supply and demand. And uh, demand, uh, in my view, overheated demand already coming out of the pandemic. We added a whole lot more stimulus. This is not stimulus. This is about, again, long-term investments and in capital assets. Those of you who are investors here uh, know that what Mitch says is true. It's a five-year bill, but the spend out's gonna be over five, 10, 20 years. And enables us, again, to make our economy more efficient, more productive, which leads to more supply and, uh, and therefore should be counter-inflationary. And that's what the economists have said. Uh, University of Pennsylvania did a good study on our bill talking about how many jobs it will create and what the economic impact will be. But the part that I thought was most interesting was the fact that they say that this is, you know, going to be long-term, making our economy more productive and efficient, which is our biggest challenge. Quick, yeah, just to add to this, when we came out here, you threw some shade on how much fun infrastructure was was not going to be. Um, the truth of the matter is, it, it's, it, you know, when you have a, events like we have going on in the country right now, and I don't mean to minimize those, they grab your attention right away. The reason this is so exciting is because if we figure out how to do this as a country, there's really not anything that we can't do. We've lost the ability to actually come together across aisles and to get something this big done. We've also lost the muscle memory of how we execute and how we get government to work with the private sector, the not-for-profit, the faith-based communities to deliver a product on the ground that people can see, be proud of, that need and improve people's lives. And this is the challenge that America has. And I told you that it was related to Arnie's conversation like this. When Aaron was sitting here telling you about what the certificates that he just got, that's the kid that the president saw when he was passing this bill that needs to go to work on every one of these projects. In the city of New Orleans right now, when I left, there were 38,600 African-American men that were not working. Now, where in your mind do you go, how in America did we figure out how not to connect people to the work that we have? So it's a chicken and egg. We have the work now. Now we've got to drill all the way down to the ground. We have to make sure nobody's left behind. And Aaron's future, and consequently our future, depends on our ability to figure out how to make this mousetrap work better than we have in the last many years. And it's going to take all of us 
telling all of your elected officials, I expect you to get this done and to not let politics, ideology get in the way because as we like to say, there really should not be a Republican or a Democratic way to fill a pothole. All right. Mitch, one, one last, we're out of time, but yeah. I think, you know, to look at it, from a realistic point of view, our two biggest challenges, I think, are inflation, one, because the dollar is going to uh, uh, not go as far. And so we're, Mitch is working on that. We're working on that, trying to figure out, obviously, the bigger inflation issue, but also how do we be sure that we're getting this infrastructure money out in the right way. But second is workforce. We've got a real challenge in this country, as you all know, with workforce. Even now, with the economy uh, beginning to falter a little bit, and I think we're, we're going to see more of that with what the Fed is doing on interest rates and so on, we're, we're not seeing the workers, particularly in the, uh, as the economists will call it, the, the middle skills. So when Aaron sat there and talked about uh, getting his certificate, I was like, yes, because that, that's what we need. He'll, he'll get a job, by the way, uh, because people are desperate for machinists, mechanics. He's going to get a CDL, he said, his, career, his commercial driver's license. It is really hard right now for our contractors out there who are starting on these projects to have access to the workforce that they need. So this is a challenge we have as a country in this legislation that's currently under consideration, also bipartisan, also one where we've got some bipartisan challenges but opportunities. We have legislation to encourage more workforce training, um, apprenticeships, but also something called the Jobs Act that Senator Kane and I have in there, which says, yes, we give money to colleges, Pell Grants and so on, that's fine. Let's extend that to these shorter term training programs some young people choose actually to go to a two or four year institution because they can get a Pell, this is for low income families, but they can't get a Pell to get a, a course like Aaron got. So he somehow found the money to do it, God bless him. But for a lot of young people, they cannot afford the cost to get that industry recognized certificate. We as a society need to encourage that. Those are the kind of people we need right now. We need to hold those jobs up and show respect for those jobs. Let me, uh, thank you. Let me ask one more qu a question because we're out of time. Mitch, this is a question for you. And this is prompted by your last answer. Uh, I know you're busy uh, running infrastructure right now, but um, it's a question that you've gotten here before and you're gonna get again if you come back to Aspen. But what are your plans in 2024? Or 2028. Why, why I ought to. <laughs> Listen, I work for President Biden. He's my president. I support him. He's running for re-election, and I'm going to vote for him. Thank you. Um, thank you for that answer. Um, I want to thank uh, Senator Portman. I want to thank Zart Landrew for uh, participating in this conversation. And uh, thank you very, very much for being here. Thank you. That's smart, Ed. Good afternoon. I'm Elliot Gerson of the Aspen Institute. It has been our and it has been my personal privilege to bring some of the magic of the Aspen Institute to Ukraine since 2008. And in 2015, alumni of our programs in Ukraine established the Aspen Institute Kyiv one of 12 other Aspen Institutes now around the world. Few other American institutions have that kind of an operation and engagement in Ukraine today. Aspen Institute Kyiv today is more important and inspirational than it ever has been. Even in the face of an existential war, devastation, and yes, evil of a kind that we never thought we would see again in Europe. Our institute now operates there with its women largely in temporary exile, sheltering their children from horror, its men fighting for the survival of their democracy and their values, and yes, for our values as well. Standing with me here now is Yulia Tishkivska, the executive director of the Aspen Institute, Kyiv. After the first... <laughs> After the first bombs fell around her and her three children under six, it took her six weeks 
of stress-filled travel to find a new, safe, temporary home for them. And indeed, Yulia returned briefly just last week to Kyiv. I want you all to understand that it is only due to Yulia and her gifted and supremely connected and respected team of Ukrainian patriots that we are able, with our partner NBC, to bring you the following extraordinary interview. For those of you who are here today for session two of the Ideas Festival, and for those of you who are in session one who didn't get a chance to see the presentation that Yulia gave, I'd urge you all, and it's a reminder that we do this with everything we do at the festival, to take a look on our website and go to YouTube to see her presentation. I guarantee that you will be in awe of her passion, her bravery, and her resolve as a mother, as a wife of a husband who did not plan to be a soldier, and as a friend of people, a dear friend in many cases, of people who literally die every day for their country. So, Yulia, again, we thank you for all of that. Thank you. And a quick note before I turn things over to Richard Engel. At 7 p.m. Eastern Time this Sunday, July 3rd, NBC will be presenting an hour-long primetime special aimed at educating and raising funds for those whose lives have been shattered by this crisis in Ukraine and spreading awareness of this global tragedy through the power of entertainment. Ukraine Answering the Call will include special appearances by Jose Andres, Andres John Batiste, Kristen Bell, Brandy Carlisle, Brian Cox, Jeff Daniels, Vera Farmega, Lena Hetty, Alicia Keys, Simu Liu, Julianne Moore, Brad Paisley, Rosie Perez, and more. We hope very much that you will watch. Now we're going to turn things to Richard and Slava Ukraini. Thank you. Mr. President, thank you very much for, for giving us some of your time. Russia invaded this country four months ago because it wanted to drive a wedge between Ukraine and the West. It didn't want Ukraine to get too close to the West. The opposite seems to be happening now with the EU formally accepting Ukraine as a candidate. How important is this for you? How historic of a moment is this? Very important. For me, it was always very important for Ukraine not to become a buffer zone, exactly like that, from the point of view of geopolitics. The Ukrainian people chose the European way, the relevant values. These values correspond in Europe, the United States and Ukraine, and we want to be part of these values. Yet, once upon a time, there was the Soviet Union, we were part of this state, we were part of this Soviet Union, our parents were born there, and I was born there in those times. However, today we want to be independent. Even before the Soviet Union, Ukrainians wanted to have their own land, their own traditions, and I believe this is normal if one respects Ukraine's choice of sovereignty. At last, we have independence, and you see how hard we are fighting for it, and how we are fighting for these values. Two Americans answered your call, as, as many did, to come here and fight for Ukraine's democracy. They were captured. The Kremlin won't rule out that they could face the death penalty. Are you, can you do anything to help their case? First of all, I want to sincerely thank all those heroic fighters from countries all over the world who have come and volunteered to defend our independence. I have said, everyone understands, that today this war in Ukraine is here on our lands, but 
However, tomorrow the war could be in Europe and the day after tomorrow in the United States. Therefore, it is utterly fair to say that this war in Ukraine, it is already a war in Europe, a war in the US. It's just that in terms of territory, it is happening here. And so I am grateful to all our heroes. This is war. You know that, unfortunately, there are thousands of Ukrainian prisoners of war as of today. That's what war is like. And there are also guys from the UK and brave guys from the US who unfortunately have been taken captive. We treat them just like Ukrainians. What can the president do? Right now, in the intelligence services, we are negotiating with the other side, which holds our prisoners captive. We are discussing Ukrainians in the same way as guys from the US or from the UK. Our task is to liberate every one of our fighters. Are there any active negotiations going on right now yeah. to, to, to help these Americans, to get them out? So I want to stress once again that right now our intelligence services, the main intelligence department, the chief, the head of the intelligence himself, is dealing with precisely this. There is a center, a specially built center, where there are specialists working only on this problem, and there they are just speaking of returning POWs. I'll stress once again, unfortunately, prisoners of war from other countries, Ukrainians, everyone. The fact of the matter is that by not releasing British or US soldiers, you understand perfectly that Russia is just doing so in order for these countries to communicate with it which, because of this aggression on the part of the Russian Federation, have very fairly isolated this political military leadership, because they, with their first steps, have isolated themselves from the civilized world. I know you speak English. Is there something you would like to say directly to the families of those two Americans? Yeah, it was a pleasure. Yes. Um, I'm not sure that I that I that um, I will I'll find uh, very uh, very you know important words, but so but but they will be you you have to be sure that they will be from 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 me from my from from my heart and from I think from hearts of all the Ukrainians that you guys what what can I say they they are heroes. And for me, they are the same like Ukrainians because they give and they gave the, 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 the main things they had, their lives, their lives. But I'm sure that we'll fight for them and we'll get them back. And of course, they will come back to, to your families, to, to their children or to their, I mean, the relatives, parents. And uh, for me, it's a great honor that there are in the world some soldiers, some, some people, just people which are not afraid, not have been not afraid and they came to uh, support us, our sovereignty and our independence. And of course, I want also uh, to thank for all the American families. I know in all the small cities, small vi villages there, I, I think so that they are also brave like, like our people in these small villages, which after attack, uh, after attack from Russian side, they just came from there out from their uh, houses and they blocked all, all the roads our Ukrainians and and did everything, and and I and I know that in these small villages in USA, I, I know I saw a lot of video where people just you know uh, on their window like yeah, they hung, hang something yeah they hung our, their flags our yellow blue flags so thank you for the support. There are reports, rumors. They're not confirmed that Vladimir Putin is sick. The Kremlin denies it, but there are these reports that he shakes, that he had cancer. Do you know anything? What do you believe? Is he, is he sick? Yeah, just a question. To be frank, I don't know what is happening with Vladimir Putin, but I believe that over there they are very sick in general. But it seems to me it's more complex than the disease that you are talking about. This is a sickness related to the respect of our people, a sickness related 
to invasion a sickness in terms of the torture committed on our lands. I feel that this is a complicated moment, that we are talking about a sickness, and unfortunately this is not a question of one person. I understand that, unfortunately, many people in Vladimir Putin's entourage are sick, sick with over-inflated ambitions, unnecessary ambitions, with no understanding or respect towards international law or simply no respect towards people's lives. For me, people's lives are priceless. This is the most important thing we have. Life is our treasure. For them, it's nothing. It's simply a resource. I think this disease is dangerous for our country. As for the other stuff, I feel it's just rumors. It's, I'm not interested. You want Russia to be declared a state sponsor of terrorism. Do you think it would matter? Sanctions don't seem to be slowing down Russia's offensive. Why would this change things? It's very important. I want to thank the Senate, the United States, and the President for supporting this resolution of declaring Russia a state sponsor of terrorism and the policies of sanctions, which you have already mentioned, all of it is working. All this is isolation. This economic isolation is the isolation of the Russian Federation from the civilized world. It's working. It's just not a very fast process. Unfortunately, when an embargo is put on oil production, the question is whether everyone does it. This embargo, have they introduced? Yes. Because when sanctions aren't introduced on a 100% basis, you won't receive a 100% result straight away. I really want all sanctions to be upheld by all nations. And then there would be a, a real blow, an immediate blow. But you see that with all these talks and dialogue, well, you see democracy has its pluses and minuses. I believe that there are many more pluses. But nonetheless, in these things, I feel when you are defending democracy, you shouldn't look for long explanations and talks. We need to bring in tough sanctions, because when a terrorist state is attacking you, only a show of strength can stop it. And strength is in unity, so sanctions will work. The question is just of time. That's how it is. You are now recognized around the world, but people don't know as much about how you think. Your wife told this story in a relatively rare interview in The Economist. She said that on the first night of the war, it was the middle of the night, she woke up to the sound of what she thought were fireworks, and she opens her eyes in bed and sees you already fully dressed in the other room, and you say to her, it's started. What were you thinking at that moment? What went through your head? What did you do next? I only thought about us, about our nation. I only thought of, of Ukraine. I immediately went to my office. I was ready. I was prepared, for want of a better word. I didn't waste time on reflecting. We gathered immediately, gathered our military committee, and we were ready to fight back. There is no point wasting any more time on this moment. The main thing is to make a decision, not delve into what's, what will happen tomorrow or the day after. You need to think of what's happening now. There's a now legendary story that the Americans in those very early moments offered you safe passage out of the country, presumably so you could set up a government in exile, but that you said, no, I don't need a ride, I need ammunition. Is it true? Did, did you do that? And, I and, think, and, yeah. and how, did it, how did it happen? I think yes, but it happened, I think it happened many times. At that moment, um, at that moment, those days, the first day of the war, a lot of leaders called me by phone and tell, told me that we, 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 you have to go, you have to ride, you have to run. Uh, and a lot of them, it was also from, from heart. It was very directly, very openly, because they wanted just, just, just to help. And they said, we, we can give you 
all you want, all you need, airplanes or helicopters, cars or something more. And I said, no, I, I don't really need any cars. We need a weapon and we'll, we'll stay here. And, uh, and, and also a lot of, a lot of um, phone calls was about my family. It's, it's, if, you, if you decided to be in country, that is your decision, but what about your children, wife? Maybe we can help you with, with, with this situation. That was, it's okay. Thank you. Thanks, leaders, for this propose, proposition. Well, clearly you decided to stay and you're yes. still here. And many have said that your decision to stay and go out onto the streets during the bombardment, not very far from here, and say to Ukrainians, your president is here, your government is here, was a turning point in this war. Do you, do you think that? I think that it helped. I doubt it was a turning point or even if it was a very important moment or even a turning point, that's not for me to say. I think it's hard for me to be objective here, but I know for sure that it was a very important moment for the people of Ukraine. When there is bombing, shooting, when there is a full-scale invasion, they needed a president here who wasn't going to run off somewhere, who was ready to defend them and stand side by side with the people, side by side with the soldiers to defend our country. It was definitely, I don't know how much it helped, it's not for me to, to judge, but it definitely supported, coordinated our people. The people understood what the government was going to do and that the government was ready and was definitely not going to desert its people because we are the people. We are selected from the part of our community. And there was no other way we could have acted. I think it was the right choice. But even if I wasn't president, I still would have stayed here. All Western intelligence agencies, certainly all the officials I was speaking to said that the Ukrainian government was gonna fall, that the Ukrainian security services would fall in days, that Kyiv would be quickly captured, that Russian forces would just overwhelm the, com the country and, and the capital. It didn't happen. Do you think that the West, perhaps also Vladimir Putin, underestimated Ukrainians, underestimated you? I believe they underestimated Ukraine in general on different levels and in different ways. And I think that this, on the one hand, this is definitely a positive, because if they knew that I would stay, that the government would stay, that people would go out to defend their homes with their bare hands, I think if they knew, they would have prepared for this war more thoroughly. That's why this underestimation does not insult me. I think the opposite. It gave us an edge, precisely the time we needed to beat back our enemy and to deoccupy our nation. And regarding the many intelligent agencies, then I think that it's very difficult having the facts that intelligence agencies had. It's very hard to correctly estimate our ability to survive. It's very hard because you are not standing where I am. If it doesn't affect you personally, if it's not your child they're killing, it's not your home that that's burning, it's not your house they're setting fire to, it's very hard to understand properly, because before this, none of us had been in this situation, and as such, how we would act in such a hard situation, in a state of shock, many people were in shock, they were fighting in shock, normal people, not soldiers, therefore, before it happens to you, it's hard to say how you are going to react. You mentioned shock. There is a iconic photograph of you in Bucha, and you look exhausted. After Ukrainian forces push the Russians out from the suburbs around Kyiv, your forces, journalists, investigators uncovered 
widespread evidence of atrocities. What was it like for you to see your fellow countrymen executed on the streets, their hands bound behind their backs? Did it change you? You know, Neither. firstly, you'll answer what it was like for me, and then if it changed me. Sometimes when you watch a movie, a good movie, a Hollywood movie, say Saving Private Ryan or something, you are in shock when seeing how it all happens. You are amazed at the level of cinematography, graphic. You understand, wow, this is just is impossible. Then you leave the cinema theater and you think, well, that just happens in, in movies. Basically, you don't believe it all fully. With what you saw in Bucha, there was a terrifying feeling and understanding that it looked like something from a movie, a violent war movie about the effects of war. But in that moment, you realize that this is no movie. It's not from a book. It's not a biopic. It's nothing like that. It has nothing in common. It's reality. And reality is more terrifying than the film I told you about. There is less blood than in a Tarantino movie and less shooting than with Spielberg. It was just so quiet. Everything was destroyed. Dead people destroyed army equipment, there was the sense of death. And you understand that reality is scarier than any movie. And the thing that changed me or surprised me was before I didn't think that people were capable of this, that people are capable of such atrocities. When they found people in the bottom of wells, hands bound, raped and murdered, they'd done everything to them. I just didn't know that this could be done by people who, 30 years previously, we had lived together in the Soviet Union, in one country. I just never had thought that humanity could be capable of this. And this changes how you look at people. We spoke to a 10-year-old boy whose family was killed in front of him. We spoke to a 57-year-old Ukrainian woman who was raped by a Russian soldier. And she says that she told him, I could be your mother. I'm old enough to be your mother, but that he wouldn't stop. You must have heard stories yeah. like these. How do you go on? How do you keep coming out doing your daily videos, telling Ukrainians, we must keep going? Or does it inspire you to fight harder? They cannot break us, even if they decide to bomb us all and all our cities. They cannot break our nation. And we have shown this. They have shown they are not our equals because people, good people, cannot act this way, the way they did this. And these examples you know, and the hundreds of examples that I know, that I have lived through with these people, and exactly what happened in Bucha and everything else I've seen, it's something I've lived through with all the people what happened in Bucha and because of this I have become stronger, not the other way around. Why do you think it's happening? There are many conflicts, I've covered many conflicts, there's often lots of death, but not always executions and rape. Do you think this is coming from the top? Do you think these are rogue soldiers drinking too much, bad leadership? Why do you think this is happening, that there are now thousands of allegations of Russian war crimes here? Thousands of them. Thousands. Why? Very difficult question. I think that is 
that is not even a question that is the something was you know something was broken yeah with with mentality with them S- something this reminds me of of people who have been starved who have lived in wild forests who have never seen women before who have been locked up in prisons and then released and sent out with weapons saying to them do what you want the entire beast lurking inside of them has erupted out and why this happened there are lots of answers the leadership there had a great influence through the mass media because all these people are not free they don't choose what to watch what to read what to do they live in this informational forest this dead dark forest of information they live within it and don't understand how civilization is developing every day the tv tells them that they are an uber nation like what happened with the nazis that they are a superior nation they are special and everyone else is second third fifth class like meat like meat in a butcher's of different sorts the same thing is happening here it's an information policy and this always comes from the top always the leadership doesn't say hey go and rape someone the leadership created people who are capable of such horrible steps this is what happens it only happens in cases and in societies where people aren't given something and are allowed to turn into animals that's why they've taken away their rights freedom of choice democracy they don't have any of these values they don't understand the worth of a human life because they don't decide what they do how to do where to go what to do for work what to watch on TV what to watch on the internet they don't decide this system decides for them President Putin and Russian state media, Russian officials on down the line say that they're fighting against Nazis, that you are a Nazi, that the Ukrainian forces are, are Nazis. Do, do you think they're trying to dehumanize Ukrainians and, and that's maybe responsible for the brutality? Because you see you're still struggling to figure out why. They're saying that you are less than human. You're Nazis, you're, you're vermin, and therefore you deserve to get raped and killed and brutalized because that's what's happened in many other yes. countries where there have been war crimes and I'm wondering if you think the same here ah was not him you know i look back to my second or third year of university when i studied criminology and in our practicals we studied various cases various crimes and it was a very simple understanding how can a person take drugs or whatever and the first reaction when you talk to this person is that they will always say no a drug addict will always deny he's an addict an alcoholic will always deny he's an alcoholic he's not joking he will always answer tensely with plenty of detail he will answer the same way under investigation he will answer this question with lots of details and many times as he has a memorized answer this is what's happening with them who is always saying that there is a problem of fascism in ukraine it was russia where they have very radical views on human rights they exhibit nazism in their crimes in the level of atrocities they have left in their stead that's all they have been demonizing ukraine by saying there are nazis here what nazis they know that my family i have jewish blood 
that my family ha was tortured by the Nazis during the Second World War. And it's a well-known fact that we have the lowest level of anti-Semitism than nearly any other country in the world. It's a very interesting stat. It wasn't done by Ukrainian analysts. Therefore, I believed that they have justified their own crimes. This is how they have justified it. You went from being an actor and a comedian now to making life and death decisions about the future of your country. Your country's future is on the line. If you lose this war, there's a possibility, and you've said this many times, that Ukraine doesn't exist anymore. What have you learned about leadership facing this enormous challenge? Whatever my profession, before everything, I am a Ukrainian. I love my country. Before everything, I'm a man who loves his family, his children, his wife, his home. I think that these values don't depend, these main things of our life don't depend on your profession, what profession you have now, and it's not important who you'll be in the future. The main thing is that during the whole period of your life you remain a good person, open, strong, and very patriotic. And I think these values shouldn't change in a person. They come from your parents, from great teachers you come across in life. When you grow up, from school, university, and your surroundings, your friends, all these things. Also, it's still important not to be stupid. How do you say better? Not stupid. Not, not stupid, stupid. I think I think it's very important. How do you make decisions? Are you slow to make decisions? Impulsive? Do you speak to your inner circle, your wife? What's your what's your process? I analyze. I always try to analyze a few opinions. I always allocate a concrete amount of time for this. I have no time to philosophize. And there are things that require time when you make decisions about them that you must analyze. Having a few opinions, sometimes from professional people who are in our team, there are government officials, there are various scientists, activists who are not in a part of authorities. I think that sometimes your head, so to speak, should go outside your office and see what's happening on the street. Knowing people's opinions is very important too. Sometimes I talk to my parents, sometimes to my wife on different topics. And I make many decisions by myself. You have had to pull out forces from first Mariupol in the south and now a key city in the east. Are you in a stalemate? Are, you, is, are Ukrainian forces in a stalemate there? It seems like there's small advances from each side uh, every day and huge numbers of casualties. Can, can you continue in this, in this way for a long time? How do you change the stalemate? One has to understand that it's not only we who are losing. Russia is losing two. While we lose one person, Russia loses five people. Where we lose one tank, they lose five tanks. That's how we are fighting. But you have to be fair and admit that it's difficult for us because the numbers don't match. Because our tanks are outnumbered by theirs by 10 to 1. Our soldiers are outnumbered by theirs by 10 to 1. And no matter how strong we are, they outnumber us by 10 to 1, and it's very difficult, yeah. 
It's difficult for us, but we are standing. We are moving forward somewhere, and somewhere else we are retreating. But facing Russia one on one, I understand that it is going to be difficult for us, and probably we won't. We will not be able to hold out. Therefore, support is of paramount importance. Support from Europe and, first of all, from the United States. We need support from everyone in the United States, from F Society and up to the President Biden. And it's very important because everyone has to understand that it's not our war. It's not just a war between Ukraine and Russia. It's a war between the whole civilized world and the Russian Federation, their political and military leadership and their army. And everybody has to understand this. We will not be able to hold out one-on-one -on -one with them. And thank God that we are getting support. You've received a lot of weapons from the United States. Not only does Russia have more troops and more weapons, it sounds like they are using them more on the battlefield. Our, our understanding is that for every artillery shell that Ukrainian troops fire, the Russians fire 10 back on to them. It sounds like you're going to need a lot more weapons yeah. if you're going to change the balance of power or the, yeah. the balance of this, this yeah. struggle. Yeah. That's it, exactly. We have nowhere to go. We are at home. And what are they fighting for? So far, they are fighting for what they were told to do, for some words, for some fantasies about Nazism, for a sort of denazification. It's not clear what they are dying for. We know what we are dying for. We have a clear understanding of what we are doing, but you are right, they outnumber us by 10 to 1. And yes, the US gave us support. And I'm grateful to them, and I'm grateful to, to the president, but we need a lot more. That's true. What does victory look like for you? And how, how does this war end? The war will end for sure. I'm sure it will end with Ukraine winning, whatever happens. No matter how difficult it is for us, we must oust the occupiers from our land. For as long as we can, we will do that. That's our life, that's our path. In what other way can the war end? Only in this way. Are you worried? that the West will lose interest in Ukraine, become exhausted uh, from this war, focus on other things, and that you'll be increasingly isolated over time? I am worried about this thing, indeed. I really feel sometimes I hear some words, some calls to slow down in providing aid. I see it happening. It's happening all over the world. But by no means must we lose. I'm talking about the whole world. I think this victory will be shared, and it will be a victory for the United States as well as for Ukraine and for European states. I do believe in this victory. If we lose whatever they say, then democracy will lose, which means the United States will lose. That's my opinion. The European states will lose who declare the values that we have been talking about so much. I know it's not easy for everyone. I understand that it's a long distance, that it is probably difficult for some countries to understand exactly what is happening here, but they have to. It's a big task of journalism. And I'm grateful to you for being able to talk to you now. And it's a task for us to show what's going on here and that we are fighting for the same things as you. And that the war has no boundaries. Currently, the war is happening in Ukraine. But that means that the war is happening everywhere in the world. I'm sure about that. From the start of this war, you were Russia's target number one. And you will probably remain a marked man for a long time. And when you look at what happens to Russia's other critics and enemies, do you ever think about your legacy? After me, there will be a united Ukraine, 
a united people, and that's what happening. Our people are no longer divided by where they come from, be it from the west, from the center, or from Donbass, we are all united. And this war has united us, that's true. And I'm sure that after the war is over, we will rebuild our country. I don't know how much time we will need for that, how many people, how much money, and how many experts. Nevertheless, it will be a great positive thing. We will build a new state, a dream state. And yesterday, we were granted the candidate member status by the European Union, and I believe that we will be a member of the European community. It's not a bad thing, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you. That concludes our afternoon of conversation. Thanks to all Fest 1 participants, safe travels. We're so thrilled to have Fest 2 attendees for the rest of the week. Don't forget to use the hashtag Aspen Ideas. And if you haven't downloaded the app, you should, as it constantly updates as schedules evolve. Thank you all so very much.